Well, welcome everybody to another Art Business podcast episode. It's been, I think, um, more than the usual two weeks because of the Easter break. So welcome back, everybody. I know all my students are back this week for the start of what we call electives, which is where my MA Art Business students can select prog um, short units from either our programme or for, um, from other MA programmes, including um, the MA in Contemporary Art, which my guest today um, whom I'm going to welcome in a moment, um, I know that she took that programme at Southern Business Institute of Art. So I'd like to give a very warm welcome to uh, Virginia Dempster. And I first met Virginia uh, in in a role which she, she continues in, which is uh, she was actually co-founder and then gallerist, uh, curator, advisor for the, fate, the iconic, indeed, uh, Rifle Maker Gallery in Soho, which um, is such a shame that it had to close down a, a few years back now. But I know, I know that many of you will have visited that gallery and remember it. And you might remember some of my earlier podcasts where uh, Top Taylor, the, the, who was the co-founder uh, with Virginia, um, he's been on the podcast as well. So so basically, Virginia is a, uh, a dealer, an art dealer, a gallerist and curator and a, a, a cultural um, strategic advisor as well. And she'll tell us a lot more about uh, those activities later on. But the reason that I've invited her on now is because she's got some very exciting new exhibitions coming up that she's no doubt going to tell us about later. So you're very welcome, Virginia. So first, thank you so much, David, for inviting me to your podcast. And um, yes, I'm Virginia Damsa. I'm a gallerist, I'm a curator, I'm an art dealer and also cultural strategist. And uh, kind of in one sentence, I always say, I like to say that I'm cultivating um, artistic futures. And my motto is to kind of create history with my artists rather than repeating it. So kind of in a nutshell, that kind of explains who I am. And going back to the introduction, um, we had a very good run with Rifle Maker. And sometimes for me, it's I like to work with projects. And, you know, of course, Rifle Maker was a big project because we were almost 20 years in, in Soho. But it's always good to, you know, kind of um, reinvent yourself and do something new. It always keeps you young. It always keeps, you know, new ideas are good. So, yeah. I totally I agree with you. I totally agree with you. And I, I try to, I, I'm always um, telling my students they've, they've got to be optimistic, forward-looking, enthusiastic. They've come out of an awful period of lockdown and so on. And I understand some of their anxieties about their confidence going out there into the art world. But I always say the best thing to do when you feel like that is just go to a new exhibition. Um, so I would recommend that they all go to your exhibition because you see exciting <laughs> new ideas. I mean, you know, when we opened Gal uh, Rifle Maker, I was only 20, right? Now. So... <laughs> Uh, and I think that really probably saved me because I was probably naive at the time of what it will entail. Uh, but we can have a more deeper conversation about this. Um, but I think with Rifle Maker, we opened when uh, Freeze opened. And it was this time where art was very, you know, London really was the epicenter. It's still the epicenter, but it was contemporary art was really important and you could see everyone wanted to be in contemporary art no? everyone you know wanted to be involved in contemporary art no? uh, and we really opened at the right time and you know also things changed you know in 2016 things changed people maybe conjectures charges the instagram online people didn't visit galleries so much no? so you know i had to find a new model you know we used to have 200 people people through the door. We were opposite Ridley Scott. We had a lot of actors coming in. That was great, but it was busy. It was a place where people meet. Uh, and I didn't have one day where I was bored. I, you know, I couldn't even do any logistical work or any kind of bureaucratic work because people were always coming. But things have changed. So you have to adapt to, to what's happening in the world. You have to adapt to how people moving and what's happening in this world. And that's why I think it was the right time we opened and the right time we close. And therefore now my model is different and it's really about feeling what's happening in today's society and how people move and what people do. So you need to adapt, you know, I mean, the art world is a business that's been going on for a very long time, but we shouldn't be dinosaurs, right? We should adapt. So that's- I think, I think in many, 
Yeah, I think in many ways there may have been other reasons for the gallery closing, but I know that Tot, Tot likewise, I think he he's the kind of person like yourself that feels, look, we've been in this now for this period of time. Um, let Maybe now's the time to move on to something new. Otherwise, we're just going to go stale. And I just know so many contemporary galleries that after that kind of period of time, Actually, I wouldn't say anything to them, but maybe they they need a, a you know a shot in the arm or something that they they do tend to just end up becoming a little bit less exciting, um, you know. And I, just to remind, I know that a lot of my listeners, certainly my most of my students, like the average age is about twenty four, so they were many of them were even born in the early millennium. And I, I just wanted to remind them that what you said about London as a as a as a cultural center with interest in contemporary art, you know, Tate Modern opened in two thousand. Exactly. The, young, the, the YBAs, the young British artists, had already been exciting. I think the a boost, giving a boost to the contemporary art world, and 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 there was Brit, there was Brit pop in the nineties. So all of these things came together, I think, to create a really, really wonderful city. Yeah, we opened at the right time where everything yeah. was happening around us. You know, exactly. even Charles Saatchi who opened the County Hall. Do you remember this beautiful oh, location? Yeah. So it was. Interesting. I mean, I wrote an article in the Evening Standard exactly about this transition and how, you know, we need to support the art scene because, you know, that's a very important sector, you know, in the economy too, right? And um, you could see this kind of move and how things are changing. And that's why I wrote in the Evening Standard this article, which is actually show the transformation and how we still need to support this sector, you know, that's in a very important sector for tourism and for finance, for, you know... Uh, bringing m money into the economy too uh, definitely but... and that that's something that we don't often talk about when we talk about art and obviously on an art business podcast it's reasonable to talk about how actually it's very good for the economy and for it's not just good for society and culture it's very good for the economy I mean, the Art Council has cut a lot of, you know, its oh. budget and it's very difficult. It has kind of moved its budget to outside of London. Um, so, but then inside London, there is institutions that are struggling, right? Huh? And I think, if, I mean, it's when, when you think of the art business, the US is very, very strong, right? Huh? So, and But still London is, is epicenter. There's amazing, wonderful galleries, museum institution, and we really have to uh, keep, you know the the flame burning right we keep, have to keep this momentum and we have to make sure we help the 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 uh, the art sector yeah and I, I i i again i hope that any alumni of my program or oh, and, and current students are listening to this because you you need to think you're going to get on very well if like virginia you actually think like that because you're not just being selfish and thinking about yourself you're actually supporting artists if you're going to be a gallerist curator a strategic advisor as, as Virginia is, you know, you, you, if you if you think about those other people as well, because you're you're that's going to come back to you many fold, <laughs> as it were. It sounds, Virginia, as though you've we've said a lot about your enthusiasm for London. Um, would that be would you consider London your favourite city or or shall we just take it for granted that it is and no, you can choose it, another one? <laughs> no, I know you have this city uh, kind of question. So actually, my favorite city is actually Athens and New York. Oh. And, and because of the chaos, and I'm going to quote um, um, a sentence, uh, you know, uh, by a uh, German philosopher, uh, Nietzsche, which says, which I really like, one must still have chaos in oneself to give birth to a dancing star. And I think that's a really nice quote because it's not only about a city, but it's also a lot of artists have, you know, like chaos and order. So, you know, you have to have chaos within you to give birth to a dancing star. That, that's a really nice, well, it's a philosophical quote, but it's kind of, I think it resonates with a lot of us, I think. And I think sometimes in cities where there is chaos, um, you know, you, you have a lot of creative, uh, creative hubs and things happening so that's why but you know I have a lot of favorite cities but mm -hmm. you know you did ask specifically so I was trying to <laughs> did you say Athens and New York Athens in New York yeah. yeah yeah fantastic so you're not really allowed to but I think they're, su they're quite different cities so they're very um... different city but they are <laughs> kind of chaotic <laughs> yeah absolutely actually that's very true I guess London is to a certain extent as well I mean I always think London is very chaotic architecturally compared to say Manhattan at least 
and Athens, I guess, you know, am I right in saying that that obviously the centre of Athens for me as a as a as a classicist, as some as a student of and, and research of the ancient world, obviously the centre is the big white limestone rock with the Acropolis um, and its temples mm -hmm. on it, and the placa, the marketplace below. But um, as, as I understand it, I think in the neoclassical period in the eighteenth century, didn't they kind of grid plan? Athens in the 18th century to a certain extent. So they, they were trying to kind of create a sense of order. Uh, but I agree with you that when you go to Athens today, I think the, the 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 Greek people and maybe the Athenians in particular are pretty anarchic, aren't they? I mean, they, they don't like rules and regulations, maybe a little bit of like the Italians. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's like the architecture there is very, very mixed. I mean, my favorite walk is literally walking down to the from the Acropolis all the way to Plaka. And, many, and I love being in a city where you have old and new. It's so important. And I think sometimes even, you know, you know, people destroy cities and it's really, really sad. When, But I think cities where they really manage to get the old and the new, that's the, really the beauty of a city, I think. Huh? And in I London, agree. you do have this. In London, you do have this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, this kind of interesting mix of all that new yeah i mean we went to um took the students to bloomberg uh the other day and um you know it's a normal new norman relatively new norman foster building but uh, when they were when they were building it in the foundations they found incredible amounts of ancient roman remains from roman london which they exhibit opposite contemporary art i don't know if you've yeah, been there but you've got this lovely opposition of the ancient roman archaeology uh, in a case, <laughs> and then you go. Yeah. They, they they keep changing these contemporary art events, and downstairs they've actually got the Temple of Mithras from ancient Rome, which used to be on that spot, and that that is now an immersive experience when you go down to that. Yeah. So that's. Uh, we yeah, you know. we there is this in Athens actually. When you go to the tube, you have a lot of archaeological kind sure. of the things they find. So you in the can, walls. In the, yeah, you can in the tube you can yeah. see the. Used to find this that is, I always find. say that's the most crazy kind of art gallery, isn't it? I think they do a little bit of it in the Rome Metro as well, where you yeah. suddenly get this window with this ancient Roman wall from like mm. two and a half thousand years ago. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, yeah. you can, you know, London has the same. I mean, again, many of the listeners may not realise this. And if they want, if you're listening, ask me to take you around Roman London, because people don't realise there's actually quite a lot of the Roman wall that you can still yeah, see and follow. You have neighbourhoods and neighbourhoods in London that are very, very different. You know, you, can, yeah. you know, I feel like you're in a different country. That's in, uh... Which May I ask which area of London you live in, Virginia? Uh, Notting Hill. Oh, you're in Notting Hill. Okay. Yeah, but you know, um, <laughs> that's pretty kind of chaotic. Notting, it, no, it's not so chaotic. I yeah, mean, but except, you've got Portobello, and then you, Portobello, you know, you've, got, yeah. you've got these clashes of different types of people with different. Yeah, I mean, I came here a very long time where uh, actually Notting Hill was not Notting Hill. You know, it yeah. was you had a lot of antique markets. Yeah. It was very, very different. And you know, you see the whole thing. Like when I was in Sofa, I saw the change. Or when I'm here in Notting Hill, I see the whole change. And yeah. it was, you know, there was. Um, the community change here, you know, the, the shop changed, you know, before it was this very interesting antique shop, there was a lot of market, now it's like full of clothes shops. Yes. And, and it's so boring, I mean, it's like, how many clothes do you need in your I life? Know, it's perhaps got so, overexposed. There was some interesting yeah. gallery, there was some very interesting galleries yeah. here, they're all gone, it's all about commerce, and it's all about shops and clothes, there's nothing yeah. else. And oh, it has changed completely, and it's... it's you know, it's you can see neighborhoods changing. Even Soho, you know, when we first went there in the twenties, I could see um, it, it. It was different, you know. So yeah. you can see that the kind of the neighborhoods are changing. Are you kind of saying that the the chaos has perhaps gone from both of those areas that from what it used yeah, to be? Yeah, a little bit chaos more. Than, yes, definitely. I agree. Bit more than, yeah, yeah, I agree yeah. with that. Actually, yeah. I used to work in when I was. Then they lose the charm, you know, when they're absolutely. too absolutely lose the charm a little Whatever, bit. Yeah, that that yeah. that elusive word charm. I totally agree with you. And 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 if you over kind of commercialize or or make everything too bland and the same, you lose the charm. Charm and soul, charm and soul. They lose charm the charm. Soul. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, my memories of, of Notting Hill were that I used to work in the when I was a student. I used to work in the holidays in the record and tape exchange, for example, and you'd be working in there, and you know they sold vinyl when people still bought vinyl, including mm. myself, and 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 cassettes and so on. And 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 people used to walk in that shop and they like rock stars were walking. I actually worked with a rock star who was actually working there with me. But there was also the do you remember the electric cinema and Nottingham yeah, Cinema? Them. 
they used to have films at two at two in the morning on a Saturday night, which I used oh, to go yeah. to. And I'd walk like two hours back to where I was living then in Barnes because it was so exciting in the middle of the night to go to a movie. But you know, uh, Portobello is very, very interesting. I mean, whenever I have time, which I never have time, uh, yeah. on Friday, it's good to go in the morning, on the afternoon, and you find young designers. There's a lot of very famous designers who yeah. started Portobello Road. And yeah. sometimes people think, oh, I love what you're wearing. Was it? And yeah, I got it from a you know, young designer, unknown designer on Portobello yeah. Road. And you That's... get something that no one has seen, no one, you know, it's not in, and you help someone, <laughs> and someone could be a big designer so yeah. it's interesting you still have this a little bit on portobello I, Road. yeah actually i i Unique, bought interesting mm -hmm. yeah in fact actually even this waistcoat I, I i'm wearing i remember buying it probably about seven years ago now, actually i don't wear it that often um and, and and that was such a place near just near portobello road that was just a kind of young young a couple of young guys who'd set it up and now they've got kind of major stores, <laughs> you know, in posher parts of London, Paris, etc. So they've done very well. But it yeah. was really, really nice when I see those. I feel, oh, I, I actually put some seed money into supporting the development of those people, you know. Yeah, and I think that's what attracted me here first. I mean, I also like because it's next to Hyde Park and the beauty. We always, ah, we always yes. have these beautiful trees here. But yeah. attracted me a little bit the sense of the market, the sense of, you know, people making things. Uh, um and I think we still have this, so it's great. You know, our people on the weekend is packed and the market is packed. Um, yeah. But Matt, do you have any? You know, can you? And you're probably you're probably not going to tell us because we try to keep these things secret. But oh my you, no, don't ask know, me that. is there anywhere in London now which, which you think still does have a sense of that chaos, where there is a few emerging interesting art galleries and you know non-chain cafes and so on? It's difficult, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I mean the the problem is like you know you, you know when we have freeze right uh, yeah. and they and then I have clients coming from abroad and I have to take them around or even I want to go around and um like it's very easy to do the mayor fair and the Cork Street part yeah. because literally you walk out of your car or from your tube and then literally you walk from one gallery to the other yeah. but then when I have to take them to different kind of you know neighborhoods and especially the East End because all the galleries are so far away from each other I, I kind of it's very difficult to get them there they they, they don't have time i mean i remember I took a oh do you remember him tony elliott from from time out huh? sure yeah yeah and tony you used to collect a bit and he yeah. was a very dear friend of mine and oh. so he passed away yes and um he founded time out and i remember we saw this artist and i showed him an artist he really liked and Tony said, okay, we're doing the studio visit. Okay, great. So we were in the car driving and it was in this extent of the artist. And I could feel he was losing his patience. You know, he's a busy man. He's right, you know, he's, he, he runs a business. And I, I really had to kind of entertain him in the car to make sure, you know. And he said, well, next time, you know, we're caught in traffic. Let's get to the studio that is closer, you know. So sometimes yes. the problem with the galleries are too far away. It's very difficult to get the people there. Even people who are, even me who are going everywhere to see everything. You yeah. know, it's, London is big, right? Uh, and yeah. time is so limited, especially when you live in London. Uh, you know, it's it's a busy city. And it, it, sometimes it's, you know, I love to find these neighborhoods where you find something unusual. I mean, of course, we have Cork Street, we have Fistro, Vitrovia, we have Marleybone. And then we have some galleries in the East End, but those are, you know, becoming very difficult to reach. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. I guess mo I guess a lot of big cities are, are that you have the same problem. Um, certainly Manhattan. Certainly the the big one is L.A., which is really really difficult yeah, to get around. Yeah. You know? But they still have pockets, huh? you know. Yeah. And the same thing. So you're like, you know, mm. I think that's clever when galleries gather all together in different locations Into one, yeah yeah because yeah. in a way we help each other by doing this sure. you know so yeah. i think it's important and that's why my two shows literally are in cook street because one you know two minutes from each other so it's easy for people we need to make it easy right huh? that's for true well we'll come back to those later on obviously yes. but i was just going to ask you um i know one of your um one of your testimonials you mean, oh, is by yeah. um is by Peter Gabriel, who 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 used to be a big hero of, of my in my teens. Well, many, was, of us, he, was, yeah, well, many of us, I think. Many of us. Yeah, when when he was when he was with the uh, early Genesis, and I I remember seeing him um, mm. just before he the, the band split up um, and, and Phil Collins took over. 
<laughs> and um, and he was he was just so creative. And then his solo albums were amazing. And then he went into kind of like WOMAD and world music, didn't he? But I know that I know that um, you 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 know him. But I mean, I was just going to ask you what whether you could name a piece of music that if you could only take one musician, you know, one band or one musical composer or something to your desert island, what would it be? So you do, you know, I mean, I know you like to ask about the favorite music. <laughs> and actually my favorite music is the last project I work uh, on with Peter Gabriel. All oh, right. And, and uh, that was where we actually invited artists and amazing artists like A. Weiwei, Cornelia Parker, mm -hmm. uh, Oliver Eliasson, Henry Hudson, uh, Bartello Mitogo, Annette Messager, which I went to Paris and I interviewed. It was an amazing experience. And we invited them to respond to uh, each of his song. So that was very interesting, uh, kind of, we had to find the right symbiosis. And that was with Peter Gabriel, myself and Mark Besson. And we had to find the right symbiosis of uh, art and music. So, you know, kind of how the music will go well with the art and the artist had to respond to each song. And and what was amazing and I kind of, knew, I felt it, I felt it, and probably, um, you know, that was an amazing experience that uh, the album scored number one in the UK. So if you ask me what my favorite song, music, album, well, the, you know, the album which was called IO uh, album, which is Input Output, scored number one in the UK. And mm -hmm. it's, for me, it's also number one. It, it's a fantastic al album. Um, and the concert, uh, Peter Gabriel, um, toured worldwide, you know, he went to, he did all of Europe, America, UK, and I went to the to the O2 concert, which was packed, and it was the most, it was like an immersive experience, because, you know, the art was there, the music was there, I mean, it was uh, amazing to have this immersive, it was like an exhibition, really, and he was so, um, he kind of introduced all the artists, so you, you knew the work was that the work was that you that you saw you knew who the artist was and um yeah we had amazing uh response to this and of course you if you listen to the music on spotify yeah. you can see the artist who uh yeah has the video has some video on it yeah and yeah. um yeah so that's um that's fantastic yeah. that's, i did unfortunately i didn't see it but the, i love the music um I, yeah, I was listening to it, funnily enough, last night, and I was kind of washing up. <laughs> no no offence, but it's just, with, yeah. you know, it, life it is busy. You, yeah, I mean, the album takes you in kind of different kind of states. That's yeah. why I like it. Sometimes you feel a bit... Yeah. Like there was one, I remember, I was working, and I really had to dance with it, and, you know, and then the other song takes you a little bit more into a kind of meditative uh, state, yes. and then the other one more of a thoughtful, and it kind of takes you in kind of different kind of um emotions and uh that's I, why i think as as an yeah. album right, I, think, I think he i think a lot of his I, I think going back actually he was very good at that so he was very good at well i suppose to be fair a lot of good bands will will follow like a um a very loud fast exciting track with something more meditative but i think peter go was particularly particularly good at doing that yeah, and to me, he's an artist. You know, he's mm -hmm. that's what he is. You know, no, and definitely. He, I mean, and when he used to, artist. when I used to see him in in the early Genesis, you know, they people might realize they might look on YouTube. They they used to they were very theatrical. The band and he would he in particular as lead singer would dress up as the characters from his songs. It was it was really really fun. Yeah, and he collaborated with. Do you know the theater uh, uh, Robert Lapage? Oh He's yes, a yes. Theatre director. He will, you know, he also yeah. collaborated with him. Yeah, all of that kind of setting and everything. Yeah, no, that's true. And I, I remember actually when the O2 Arena actually open, opened, or it was called the Millennium Dome then, of course, in two thousand. Do you remember he he had acrobats coming down from the very high ceiling with his music and? Yeah, I mean, for me, Pina Bausch was always my inspiration when I was, mm -hmm. you know, a kid. And I like the fact that with this Peter, Peter Gabriel concert and this his new album, you have so many things. You have theatre, you have art, you have music. Of course, music is number one, but you have everything, right? Yeah. And I think that's what makes the concert very interesting. <laughs> um, I agree. I agree. I mean, it's like that, the, the traditional sort of like Wagner, the opera composer, called it Gesamtskunstwerk. 
a complete artwork where, and where also the, the audience yeah. the audience is much more hungry now Absolutely. you know we want yeah. it all right it's yeah. <laughs> so so yeah we wanted we wanted all we want yeah. we want all experiences so what about work of art this is a really difficult one for someone like you <laughs> because uh, you're yeah, probably well, going to offend someone <laughs> well, i think there's a lot of masterpiece but there's a lot of missteps too right yeah. uh, so i think because it's a difficult question i think i'm going to summarize it like this <laughs> go on Oh, okay. That's enough. That's that's, enough. that's good. That's good. Um, so, so yeah. Let's let's think about. Uh, maybe you could say something about your very. It's a really interesting educational background. So, as I understand it, you um, you you came to Cambridge in the UK to study history of art. Is that right? Yeah. So I come from a family that we're all very academic. Mm -hmm. So studying was very important uh, for us, and I studied uh, yeah history of art. art in Cambridge, and then I did a BA at Sussex University, which was very interesting. It was art and social psychology. Yeah, because it's very interesting the mixture of both, yeah. and that's why I went to Sussex University because back then they were mixing the the courses. It's very and well known. Thought, it's, it's very avant garde. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, and I thought that's great because I don't want to stick to one thing. I want to do. I want to understand people, and I want to understand art. But well, that's yeah. it. Now, you know? Yeah. So that's yeah. what you know gave me this, um, and they were doing this. And then I did this course at the University of the Arts, London, yes. which was called London College of Printing back then. I started this course, a really long course, it's called Enterprise Management in the Creative Arts. <laughs> and Henry Lydiet, you know, yes. was actually doing the course on the law, uh, the art law course yes. on this course, yeah. yeah. So I did this, but like it was a master, but it was like not enough for me. So I did a second master at Sotheby's University and it was a contemporary art master. What we uh, call MACA or the MA Contemporary Yes, uh, it may be this. And, and who was the director then? Was it Tony Godfrey? Tony Godfrey, yeah, yeah. who wrote this great book, which I... Uh, do you remember the title of the book? Contemporary um, Art? Contemporary Art. He did one on contemporary art. He did one on um, conceptual art, if I remember rightly, as well. Yeah, they're, they're yeah, classic so, books. Yeah. Yeah. So as I understand, as I understand it, I think he's now in Indonesia with some kind of art colony that uh, with artists. Oh. That's the last I heard. Oh, oh yeah, it was, it, it was great. And then I did uh, because <laughs> I, did, I started doing a PhD in performance art, which I never finished. No? Yeah, yeah, well, it, it was impossible to finish because I was running a gallery, right? And oh, to be right. honest, I think I, I've done enough education. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. No, that happens to a lot of people. It took me ages to finish my PhD. I think you, you have to start earning money and then obviously you need to put give a lot of time to your research. So maybe but, one day but, you can come back to it. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, because I did, you know, I had my gallery when I was doing the master at Sotheby's. Mm. And I was doing it part time. I think yes. I think it was the option to do it part time. Okay. So it was difficult afterwards, you know, to, to take another course. And I think you're right. Maybe I can come back to it another time. Um, but yeah. it was performance art because that was, for me, what was important at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and and obviously it would be a very different. Well, I suppose you'd now do a longer history of performance art, but it'd be probably a very different PhD from what it was then. Yes, yeah. yes, probably, yeah. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and and then the, then rifle maker. Um, can can you tell us how you came to you know how did you meet Tot for example, and how did the two because he's never told me that. <laughs> well, yeah, so to, to, uh, so we met at uh, the first freeze, which was two, I think two thousand and three, two thousand four, mm -hmm. uh, one of the yeah, and Todd was yeah, Todd was walking around with Marta Marce, who's a Spanish artist. Mm -hmm. was a show um, in Mayfair once with Marta, and Marta, you know, says, "Oh, Virginia, you need to meet Todd. Todd, you need to meet Virginia." Mm -hmm. Then we end up in Soho uh, having dinner, the three of us, and then when we left. The restaurant we came across this uh you know this building place and, to sell <laughs> yeah and we thought that oh, wow that's a great building and then that when you know we we went all back home and the next day i was in this building and i called todd and the guy, guy says oh virginia is calling you and it's like virginia and i could hear like someone playing i don't know drums or something it was it's like virginia virginia who because I mean, he met me 
And I was like, Todd, come, come. I'm in this building. I'm in the rifle maker building. <laughs> and I'm speaking to the landlord. <laughs> so I remember Todd said to me, like, I think if Virginia can get things so quickly, <laughs> maybe I better get into business with her. <laughs> Great. So that's how it started. And of course, you know, like you asked me to talk about this and I have like, I mean, because we were open for so long, I have yeah. a lot of memories from it. Yes. But I do have like, I would say, uh, maybe like six memories that, you know, I think I will never forget. And I think they are, um, you know, moments you, you, you know, that, are, that could be important. So I'm yeah. happy to go through them. If yeah, you no, no, please do. I, I've always thought it'd be great to have both you and Todd talking about the history of rifle maker. Because <laughs> I think that would be a three-hour podcast. That would be a three-hour podcast. It would, but but you see, I don't think anyone's written a history of rifle maker, have they? Well, we had have, have a lot of press and uh, yeah, but no one has actually written a book. I mean, I'd love if I had time. I would love to write the history of rifle maker and interview well, that would be you great. Todd, with all these amazing <laughs> anecdotes. It'd be. It'd be yeah. just because it needs to be, you know, someone needs could to be do my it. PhD. That could be my yeah. PhD. <laughs> someone needs to do it anyway. Tell it far away, yeah. give us a couple of these stories. Well, I think it, it's interesting. It's like, so the, my, our first client and uh, our first sale was Charles Sachi. That was quite amazing that you know, we he came, he I don't even know how he knew about us because we were like setting up, we were setting up with a young artist, and the gallery was not open, and that was our first sale and our first. Uh, client and so that was pretty impressive and back then he was very instrumental to many people to many artists so um, it's good that uh, he was there to support uh, all of us in a way I think uh, no, I mean that's for. pretty impressive actually again for for the younger listeners um, who who don't haven't read about the, the the YBAs you know Saatchi was one of the main players in the 90s supporting them buying their art put it displaying it as you said okay. earlier in, in galleries, um, like Cat, the big County Hall gallery. And, you know, what was great, I mean, I was, I said, you know, in my 20s, so I was young, but uh, when he bought the piece, I called the artist, uh, and the artist said, no, no, I don't want to sell it, because he <laughs> wanted to buy the whole work, and said, no, no, and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? What a, <laughs> what a di wanted dilemma. wanted to buy everything in your gallery, basically, before you opened Of the artist, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, I so I said to the artist, what about, if he buys it, he puts it in Cantwood Hall on display because a lot of collectors buy work and they put it in the storage and no one mm -hmm. sees it, right? Mm -hmm. And the aunt said, ooh, okay, I like this idea. Well done, Virginia, you know? So I went back in the 20s and I was like, dear Charles Sanchi, I was like, okay, and maybe thought it was daring and that happened and then the, the sale happened. So that was kind of a nice, interesting story because it wasn't so simple in a way you know you almost had to convince the artist huh? can you remind me of the artist jamie shovlin jamie shovlin that's right yeah. it was right on the tip of my tongue amazing yeah. if any if, if anyone listening does hasn't look look up jamie shovlin if you don't know his work uh because it was tremendous and then we and then another you know memorial uh ex, you know experience <laughs> uh it was uh with yoko ono which actually has, has her exhibition now tate yeah. uh tate modern and it was a performance that we did uh which was called bagism and i remember i think it was todd yeah asking her well do you think we should cover because you know the gallery was, was on the ground floor so we had a lot of people walking by and could see what we were doing and i said you know i think todd asked do you think could we shall we close you know, maybe the, the windows. So it's, you know, the, ex the exhibition and the performance, it's only inside the gallery. And no, no, she wanted the 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 public to be, you know, included, mm -hmm. you know, to, to the, the public inside and the public, well, that's why her work is is, is based on participation, right? And so she wanted the public outside and the public inside to participate in her performance. And, and we had the gallery with candles, all the galleries with candles. Huh? And I remember, at three o'clock in the morning, I had to wake up because I thought maybe I didn't turn off one of the candles. So I remember three o'clock in the morning after the performance, going back to the gallery with my pajamas to make sure the candles were off. Brilliant. Yeah, well, so, the, yeah, Top wouldn't have been very amused if you come in the next, on the Monday and it, the place had burnt down. And <laughs> Well, you know, we did everything together. So I'm saying, yeah, you yeah. know, Mind you, so, but just... I was... Hmm. Just, just for the listeners, of course, Rif the name Rifle Maker has a very interesting. Uh, could I? Can you just talk about why, how you called it Rifle Maker? Because I, I've heard Tots version, but it gets kind of changed each time. So, what well, I think you... Rifle Maker is because when we 
took the space and we took the building. We didn't want to put our name, you know. I think a lot of people put their name. Yes. Uh, and we're thinking, what are we going to call it? And then we look up and the name was there, Rifle Maker. And yeah. also the building was the antithesis of a white cube. Actually, this is what I like. Mm. Uh, I always like to do, you know, whatever, uh, the opposite of whatever everyone else is doing. Sure. <laughs> I don't like prototypes. Yes. So, for example, like with normally the prototype was a white cube but we had a wood paneling, wood floor building, yeah. and it was a workshop. This is where they were making the rifles for hunting, right? So that was interesting that we went for the opposite of the status quo. You know, we went for the opposite. Yeah, and that, I, I mean, that's, 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 why we, that's why we love the gallery. It used to yeah, be, they, yeah. I couldn't wait each time if I was doing a gallery tour with my students, I'd say, you wait till we see this guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, uh, then we had, uh, that was, you know, we well, we knew all Judy joining. Chicago. Ju no, that's oh, another. Ju then Judy, uh, Judy, and, yeah. Then we had Judy Chicago, oh. and we also we did a show in the gallery, and everyone knew her for you know her exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum and her permanent mm -hmm. um, installation there. The dinner party. Uh, the dinner party, yes. But uh, we kind of brought her back, I think, because you know we had we showed her at at at, at Freeze Master, and that was really uh, amazing. We had a very good response. We had so much press. Huh? Sure, and yeah. we showed her car hoods, which is interesting. When I said to her, oh, how did you do these car hoods? And said, so, well, she went to automotive school. It's where you learn how to paint cars. So oh, it's really? interesting. Yeah. And and uh, what is great, I introduced her to Hans Ubris from the Serpentine yeah. back then. And yes. now in May, she has a solo show at the Serpentine Gallery. Wow. So you were kind of like the seeds for that introduction of a very yeah, I mean, you, you know, artist, I would it? think I'm a seed, but then things don't happen immediately, they right? I mean, like that's that. why you need yeah. to plot ideas into people's head and things yeah. happen slowly. Because, you know, also when you speak to people, you, you know, you have to be careful of maybe it's not the right time. It's all about timing too, Absolutely. right? Uh, but I still have this photograph of us at the Serpentine talking to each other. And I remember it was a great meeting and I, it's, it's very... Um, I would say clear in my head, um, yeah. you know, the conversation we had back then, and I'm happy it's coming to fruition now. Um, That's brilliant. I, I actually I do remember um, going not with students. I was just passing by as one does, and I I remember seeing Top through the window and going in and saying hello, and he said, "Oh, come downstairs. There's someone I'd like to introduce you to," and he said, "Oh, this is Judy." I said, "Oh, J Judy, who? If you don't mind me saying, Judy Chicago." Oh, wow! You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know the of subject course. of the first feminist he, art history he, i was reading you know she's a force of nature the force she of nature she was just so nice and so i amazing. mean I, I think i believe like you know especially all of us who are in the art world because mm. it's something that we love and we something that it's so important for mm. us and for everybody really mm. uh, you know art is very important it's, it's part of history it's what makes history and everything so so I think, you know, when you see people like this, you know that you're going to be, you know, in your 80s, you know, 90s, and you'll be doing something you love and you're still going to be there. That'll give you, I mean, have you noticed how creative people age very well? Yes, I have. Actually, yeah. it's quite funny because um, I've been very ill over the last couple of years and when I, I was still working and, and then uh, I went down, took students down to St. Ives um, and last last year, in fact, and um, I remember this went in and this gallerist said, looked at me and she said, you've got beautiful skin. And I thought, well, if you know what I've just been through. And then it suddenly occurred to me, actually, I was I was told to rub lots of moisturizing cream into my aging flesh, you know, and that's yeah. obviously. But I, th I think I also like to think that hopefully one, even with illnesses, that you 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 grow old gracefully if you're into art. You know, it's sometimes with illnesses you have rebirth too. Mm. True, that's, tr that's absolutely true. With some of my friends who had problems yeah. like this. Huh? Yeah, so we've had we've had Saatchi with Jamie Shublin when you open Yoko oh, yes. with performance and open okay. air and stuff, and then Judy, Judy Chicago and next. And then well, and the Yoko Ono, of course, who we shouldn't yeah. forget this. Uh, yeah, and whose show, of course, is on at Tate Modern, and I'm I'm it's hoping to go around. I'm hoping to go around there with Tot, and then we were going to do a podcast about. His, oh, his, you know, yeah, great. about yeah. his experiences with yeah. with Yoko Ono, so. and and then then the other thing was I still have this imagery very vivid in my uh, head of we did a show with Gavin Turk 
yes. which was Gavin Turk as Andy Warhol, because, you know, Gavin Turk always questioned what is authorship, and, yeah. you know, um, so authenticity. And yeah. Gavin Turk was like, came in and said, oh, I don't know where to park my motorbike. And I said, well, park it. In. And he came in directly into the, the gallery with the motorbike, oh. sitting inside the gallery with the motorbike, talking about his exhibition, Andy Warhol, uh, Gavin Turk as Andy Warhol. And that was a fantastic exhibition. Very well, we sold very well. Yeah, also. I remember uh, the I remember that amazing exactly. piece on copper with the kind of piss on it. Uh, is that oh, that to... was that's another discussion we yeah. had to have some client pissing on some on some, some <laughs> artwork. But it was Gavin Turk, wasn't it? It was Gavin Turk, and then we showed it to Sotheby's. Uh, we asked Sotheby's if we can show the piece paintings. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Oh, that was, that was so crazy, so crazy. And, and then I'll tell you two more, and this is me saying yes, too many yes, and then maybe regretting it afterwards. I didn't regret it, but it was like we, uh, Julie Verhoeven wanted to put some fresh eggs into the gallery. And I said, yes, great, let's do it. And the, uh, it was so difficult to work in the gallery because the eggs, they were smelling. So mm. we had a you know, dozen and dozen of eggs in the gallery, fresh eggs. Well, of course we had to change it, but the smell was really intense. And then Alice Anderson wanted to rub the whole building with hair, you know, yes. red hair, synthetic hair. And I said, yes, I tend to say yes to crazy ideas. <laughs> and then kind of when it happens, I'm thinking, oh my God, what did I get myself into? But then actually when it, you see how people's response, then you like, you feel, you know, you, you feel the reward of, you know, I. It's I, it's a leap of faith, isn't it? It's like taking a decision to walk into a, you know, blindfolded into a, into a chasm. I mean, I remember yeah. the Alice Anderson. It was that I'd never seen anything like that before. Would you like to describe it for the listeners? Yeah, but I think what I want to say is that art should still be experimental, right? Oh. If it's an idea that is too, you know, kind of polished, you yeah. don't have any you know, any kind of mistakes coming out of it. And sometimes out of mistakes, you get really great things, right? Yeah. So sometimes I, I entice artists to give me the more kind of crazy ideas, even an idea that I think is not feasible. Because if you tell me it's not feasible, I'll be like, oh yeah, it is feasible. We make it feasible, mm -hmm. right? So, um, yeah, so with Alice Anderson, what we did, we uh, we had to buy a lot of synthetic hair. I think it was, I don't know, we went, I think we went to China to do this. And we kind of rubbed the whole building uh, like a kind of crystal uh, with synthetic hair that was going inside the building, outside the building, kind of, you know, and it was, I mean, I could see how many people stopped and was you know, looking at this. Huh? And then they went on to the Freud Museum and then it went to the uh, Royal Opera Museum yes. in London. So they moved on. It was like a kind of traveling installation. Yeah, uh, I remember it in the Royal Opera House lobby. I, I seem to remember that they had to take it down in the end because a couple of ladies had just had were going to the opera and, and it it ruined their hair, ruined their proper <laughs> one. So they That's complained great. and they were VIPs, so they had to take it down. Oh, no. <laughs> That's a great story. I don't remember this. <laughs> yeah. But I seem to remember the hair also went up one of your chimneys, didn't it? Yeah, it went through the chimney. Went yeah, the it went chimney. through the chimney. It incredible. was a complex installation, but I don't know why in my head I felt it was effortless because I think it was maybe I don't know. We we had a great team, and mm -hmm. I think we were, were all well together. But it was in a way complex, right? Now to get it all right now sure, through the, sure. the building. So anything, any other stories about Rifle Maker or should we move on to what you're doing now? Well, I think I have so many stories. We'll be here forever. So we can move on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe another time we could actually one day have this sort yes, of um, two hour. Very marathon podcast Pleasure. with top about Pleasure. rifle maker but but so, so as i understand it you've you've adopted a new you know particularly during and post lockdown am i right in saying you've adopted a new model whereby you're not going to have a permanent gallery or go and i think quite a lot of people yes. are doing this you're you're having pop-up galleries and putting exhibitions in different parts parts of well London. i'm sure i'm not alone but back you know then when i had rifle maker i could see the changes and yeah. i'm very sensitive to how the world is is moving and mm. how people are doing things right so as i said you know you have to adapt and you have to be flexible so when i saw these changes i thought my goal is to get as many people as possible to see my office to see the exhibition to see the artworks that's my task right that's my task and my responsibility towards my artist or towards you know towards the people i'm working with so to do this i came up with the idea of working with other galleries so, uh, you know, I work with another gallery and I'm usually responsible for curating the shows and putting it all together. 
And, and therefore, you know, you have almost two galleries working together. So that kind of reinforces, uh, you know, the, you know, kind of the results that reinforces the results you get. Then I will take temporary spaces and I will have this kind of urgency that the exhibition is a certain uh, time. Then I'm going to have interesting collaborations and unusual collaborations. And then topical themes, because we're all interested in topical themes. And by doing this method, which is, in a way, curated art fairs, collaborations, interesting collaboration with other galleries, uh, interesting collaboration with unusual collaboration and topical themes, and temporary spaces, um, I, I think I get much more uh, viewers to see the work. Uh, and you know, with the art fairs, I did a written art fair, uh, I did Photo London, and I was showing this um, American artist, Ruchi Holler, and mm -hmm. it was actually her experience. Uh, she she grew up in America with her family were working in the in the factories where they were making creating the atomic bomb uh, for you know in, in America the you know where they bombed Hiroshima and she her family didn't know what they were doing mm -hmm. back then because it was all top secret huh? but now it's one of the biggest cleanup operation in America they're trying to clean up all this so we talked about this and it was more of a documentary about her family experience working there working under secrecy because no one knew and they didn't know they were doing everyday moves that they didn't know what they were doing and her experience of you know her family and now being today is being america biggest cleanup project and then you have oppenheimer the film yes. coming up Hill, we were, even before the film we mm. talked about something that it's recent that it's preoccupying you know preoccupied a lot of people back then you know, and 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 then you've got the film coming up. So it's interesting that we were before the film, and uh, because she's based in uh, in Hollywood, she knew that this was all coming up. So it's a like, great we are there before the film. So I like to talk about issues that are, you know issues that have an interesting story around issues that we want to bring back because we want to bring you know kind of re kind of reconsider and review. Mm -hmm or issues that are current and we want to talk about it because we're curious and we, you know, these issues they haven't really been tackled yet and we want to understand them deeper and better. So um, that's kind of my uh, my way forward. And also I help a lot of about, I'm try, artists. I'm trying to empower artists through uh, kind of business development and business advice. I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds very dry, but it's actually working with artists as a kind of business in partner. And it's a very difficult job um, because it's um, it's very not straightforward and mm -hmm. helping artists uh, can be very successful sometimes and sometimes it doesn't work. So it's a difficult um, thing, but you know, I... Uh... Yeah, we have a we have a, an optional emerging artist project, which I lead where we put our students um, together with um, that, you know, there's obviously elements of choice and the artist has to get on with the person and they meet up and, you know, uh, our art business students, um, this time of year when they actually have learnt something, hopefully, um, they they, we, they start working with artists of the same age group who, who, who can do with the advice that my students by now have learned about the, you know, the, that's the, great. the art world. Because yeah. I remember I was teaching at Christie's yes. and I asked them if they can have a um, mentorship yes. program. So when students were about to finish the course, I'll yes. go there and speak to them. And I remember some students, there was one student said to me, oh, I really want to go into press. And I said, okay. Mm. I said, do you like going out every night and speaking to people? Mm. No. Uh, do you like to be social? No. I said, why do you want to go into press? So it's so funny. Sometimes people really need to kind of, you need to sit down with people. And especially, you know, with what I do, I'm trying to understand, you know, the artist. And sometimes you can have something that enables them to do something because yes. of something, maybe of insecurity, or maybe because they haven't reached the right people. Uh, or maybe they're not in the right context, or maybe they don't know where to go. And it's very difficult by yourself. I mean, you know, when you run a business, because artists run a business, is it's it's tough. It's tough to be able mm. to produce and to be also able to run a successful business. Very so having these two brains in the way, it's some artists do it very well, but you still need a team. 
Yeah, it's very unusual, isn't it? And, and it's just a matter of time that you want to be spent. It's like someone like myself that, and I'm sure you have this as well, I'd like to spend all my time writing, um, but 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 I have to do my job. And, and yes, but, yeah, yeah. The, but the job, if you get it right, if you get the balance right, is so exciting because one sparks off the other. Well, I mean, one thing I'm going to say is, you know, with what I do, I love what I do, you know, but... Mm -hmm. It has become so bureaucratic. Huh? Yeah. There's so many regulations that have been put in place for us, you know, for yes. curators, art dealers, and it's sure. it's it become like a almost like a, I feel like it's it's more bureaucracy than joy of curating or speaking to artists. Huh? So that's a little bit of a I would say a drawback sometimes. But um, has that has that do you think that's got worse see. since the early millennium? Are there more rules? I know money, yes. I mean, now like the, money laundering came in. Yeah, the, we became more regulated. Yeah. And of course, you know, we, we have to prevent all this. Yeah. But it's it's a lot of weight, especially when you have a small business. It's a lot of yes. weight. Uh, right. you, you end up, you know, um, doing much more bureaucracy. Yeah, and, absolutely. And becoming like an officer and that's it, yeah. you know. I feel like I'm an officer rather than a curator. <laughs> you know, so, so, so yeah. On a more positive note, your, yes, your, your sh the shows that are on now, or I think there's one on now and one coming up, if I remember rightly, and and I right. know that you're now working, um, as I would expect you to, with artists who are who are working with AI in particular, which is like you yeah, know, you maybe we start with the current one and then yeah. AI exactly. is for the for the upcoming one. So the current one is uh, is titled Art Through Time, mm. Contemporary Reflections, mm -hmm. and what I was interested to see in in this exhibition to see with all of you and to see myself is I want to see the evolution of art uh, through time. And I wanted to see the evolution of history through art. Um, and in a way, when you see the exhibitions, it goes for all the way from 1900 Paris, which Paris was amazing at this mm -hmm. time, right? With all the surrealist artists from, mm -hmm. you know, Duchamp, Breton, you know, all these great Absolutely. artists, Dali, and going all the way to London, 2024. So it's mm. really interesting. It's almost like a, a fast forward. We go Paris 1900 with great city, you know, with great artists and great thinkers, all the way to London, 2024. Yes. Um, so that was interesting. And you see a lot of recurrent themes during yes. this centuries more than a century you know gap there but you see a lot of common themes yeah and um, there's kind of an argument that london in 2000 was not was was kind of what paris was in 1900 yeah yeah we oh, can say this but i don't know if you can we don't know i mean in a hundred years castle. time people will hopefully be talking about jamie shovelin as a as yeah. one of those artists you mentioned in Paris in 1900. I think it's different eras with different charms and different yeah. things we learn from all of them. You know, sure. I don't think you can compare something like this. I think it's, it's very different. But sure. so in this exhibition, you know, I've managed to get some, I invited some really great artists. I'm very, very excited, especially Michael Greg Martin. Mm -hmm. He's one of my heroes and he's like the godfather of so many artists. So, you know, when when you say his name and you say his name to artists that you can see everyone's being very warm about him. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, he was a teacher at Goldsmith, mm -hmm. some, you know, maybe a, you know, the godfather of the YBA, the mm -hmm. young British artist. Yeah. Uh, but I think what I'm interested most in his work is the fusion of conceptual art, mm -hmm. pop art and minimal art. That's why I'm like, kind of how he mixes it all up huh, to create his own, you know, his own work and his own identity. And of course, we all know the oak tree, which back then I thought it was very strange, but now I understand. So the oak tree was one of his first work, conceptual work of Michael Greg Martin. And it's, um, it's titled the oak tree, but it's a glass of water with a shelf, right? Mm -hmm. But it's an oak tree. So if you want to, so it's all kind of the playing with perception, you know, of sometimes what you see, but it's maybe something else. So, so I remember that funny story that every time I said, but no, it's a glass of water with a shelf. And people <laughs> said, no, it's an oak tree. And one day it was, I think it was sold to a museum and he had to travel to, to the museum and it was uh, stuck in customs and said, sorry, but we don't take nature. You know, it's, you know, through customs and said, but yes. no, it's the first time they had to 
you know, admit that it was not an oak tree. It was a, <laughs> it was a glass of water on the shelf. <laughs> but I think it's it's very interesting uh, how you know, kind of, kind of encouraging question of perception and reality. I think that's the way I would say it. it's kind of questioning perception and reality. You know, whatever sometimes what you see is not what it is, huh? right? And I think that's what Michael Greg Martin wanted to do. And then I've got them in dialogue with another great master, Alexander Calder. And it's not a straightforward response because if you look, think about them, you might think, well, they don't have anything in sim similar. But for me, um, when I think of Alexander Calder, I think of this moment that he was invited to New York to do an exhibition. And he turned up in New York to do the show and the galleries look at him and said, excuse me, where is the work? We, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have, a... and said here. And he opened his hand and he's got wires in his hand. So, and from everyday objects, which are the wires, he created these beautiful sculptures. And Michael the Greg Martin from everyday objects, from keys, phones, uh, luggages, chairs, shoes, clock, he will kind of create this painting so I like the fact that, you know, from the mundane, from the everyday object, they will transform into a different reality, you know, again, perception and reality. I like the fact they're both interested in geometrical shapes, vib vibrant color, how the viewer is perceiving the work. Um, and therefore, you know, that was kind of an interesting dialogue. Then we've got another interesting conversation between and you, you probably know the, both of the artists, is uh, modern artist Roberta Mata, Chilean modern artist, you know, mm -hmm. kind of surrealist, abstract impressionist. No? Wow. And then Keith Tyson, mm -hmm. which Keith, if you listen to this podcast, he's going to laugh, but he turned the prize because now every time you see Keith Tyson, you always have the turn the prize because he won the turn the prize, I think it was 2002. Sure. And it's really amazing. He won the turn the prize with an idea that today is like it was he was kind of i would say before his time because he did this um uh this sculpture which was called the thinker based on rodin he did this beautiful stuff which the sculpture was computers inside and he was thinking about how computers he was talking about ai i mean no one talked about ai in, in the early two you know, in 2002, no one talked about AI. We didn't even know, I didn't even know what was happening. And he was talking about ideas back then that no one knew, right? So that's very interesting. So we have Keith Tyson and uh, Roberta Mata. And why I selected them is because both do not like to have a fixed notion of movement or style. You know, it's like they don't want to be classified uh, into a kind of, movement, style, medium. Uh, they kind of refuse, uh, and it's both in their both uh, kind of, I would say doctrine, but if they have one, it's that they don't want to have this classification. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, kind of very interesting of a, no a notion of a non-fixed style and media that both is very strong mm -hmm. uh, to both of them. And then, um, Roberta Mata uh, was an architect initially. And uh, he worked with um, Corbusier in the atelier of Corbusier. So that's how he started. And Keith Tyson started as an engineer. Uh, so I thought that was interesting because both, like they kind of, for them, it's very important, the dynamics of the world the in integration of the dynamic, dynamics of the world, or, or, or Roberta Malta said it, he calls it like the forces uh, that faces our world. So they're very interested in things like science. I mean, mm -hmm. Roberta Malta is, was very influenced by Einstein's um, theory of relativity, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, the same thing with Keith Tyson, he's very interested in mathematics, science, uh, computers. Uh, technology, so you see that the practice goes beyond, you know, and and when you see the two paintings which are close to each other, and and, and the show is at um, twenty seven Cork Street, so it's easy to get to. Um, you can see both paintings have this sense of subconscious, like something that it's happening, but you don't really know what's happening. This sense of it's irrational, 
but the same thing, seeing you, even if it's irrational and you get lost in it, you can see still traces like anchors. And you can think, oh, yes, uh, that's I understand. That, this I don't understand. So I think there is a lot of common themes there. And uh, did they, did you as a curator put those two words together or were they aware? When they were making them that they were going to be put together yes yeah, some artists make completely new works for the exhibition yeah yeah there's an artist called xavier ellis huh, mm -hmm. who did um in the kind of i showed him some picasso painting some picasso drawings huh, and he responded to them and at the end when he responded to them i, I looked at like the work and i said but it doesn't what's the painting. connection and he said no uh, he said picasso i looked at picasso not like picasso the romantic picasso the revolution. He thought of he thought of Guernica. So he's two works. I call Guernica one, Guernica two, and mm -hmm. they are response to Picasso Guernica. Mm -hmm. But they don't. So, actually, no one would guess that unless they looked at the title. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think if you're curious, you will guess it. Now. Okay. You know, I think okay. you need to 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 to, to mm -hmm. look at Kef, and then you see you have the press release. I mean, some mm -hmm. some you, you there's one example which is uh, Salvador Dali, and he, it's a very interesting ink, ink drawing and it shows how America will be in 50 years. Mm -hmm. And Emma Bennett, which is a British contemporary artist, responded to this ink uh, drawing. Mm. And you would see, because it's the the one of Dali is full of flames, so New York in flames, mm -hmm. or it could be America, I don't know if it's New York, but it's America, full of flames. And that Emma, her, her work is it's a landscape with flames. So you can see immediately the kind of interesting um, mix up there. Yeah, but, then, uh, yeah. 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 And then there's another interesting conversation, which is Marc Chagall, which I think many people know, with Talan, which is a Danish artist. Mm -hmm. And those two works are very close to each other. And you can see there's some kind of um, understanding with each other because they have this childlike, naive exuberance so like the colors are very vivid, this kind of this uh, bold colors, bold brush strokes. Um, some of the themes both reminds you of Fauvism a little bit, and there's a little bit of myth and a little bit of uh, Chagall was uh, Jewish and he there's a lot of folk stories in there mm -hmm. and uh, and Jewish stories. And Tala also was born in, in Israel, in Tel Aviv and then immigrated. So there's also a sense of displacement. And you can see when you see the work, it's obvious that you know you can see there is a resemblance on some similarities. Of course, it's a completely different century. Uh, saying this, when I was listening to Talon, uh, he said that he, sometimes his work is like a circus. You know, you don't know what's actually really happening. And uh, my, my, uh, Chagall was very inspired by the circus. Circus, yeah. So, you know, you, sometimes you make these connections. I mean, for me, it's like, when I look at contemporary art, I think of modern art, and when I think of when I see modern art, I think of contemporary art. So it all goes together, you see. These connections are coming together, and like Keith Tyson said, you know, we are connected with the dynamics of the world. I feel mm -hmm. I'm connected with the dynamics of the art world. Um, so yeah, so I think that was interesting, kind of um, you know, conversation with I modern love. contemporary, mm -hmm. you know the time frame of more than a century. Yes. But when you think of common themes, there's a very strong common theme and it, which is death. And mm -hmm. it's quite apparent, you know, a lot of artists talk about it. Now, there is a, a creative technologies artist. A di there's a digital uh, artwork actually in the in the show. Among the Dali and among the Picasso you also have and the Renoir, you also have a digital artist uh, called Scott Eaton. He's an American uh, multidisciplinary and uh, and uh, and digital artist too and he created this piece which is recording someone's face which is his friend i think it's 25550 days of his friend from birth to death so wow. you see the face of this person and you see it's quite there's a lot of cubism in mm -hmm. this uh, digital artwork which is moving and mm -hmm. you can see the face very strong and slowly, slowly fading, 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 fading wow. away. And, the, you know, and we put it next to uh, Henry Hayden, which is a Polish cubist artist of the 
you know, Paris 90, early 1900. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of interesting because, you know, one is cubism and the other one is digital cubism. So mm -hmm. there's kind of, you see a lot of common themes. And so that's one. There's a lot of subconscious, again, common theme, you know, within a one cent a century gap, common themes of uh, subconscious, everyday objects, and sometimes the mundane. There's a, lo a lot of still life. And I think probably we still, you know, because it's part of our life, still life. So it's still there. Uh, very strong um, and one thing that you know is I think probably more mainly art people will understand is you have the refusal or the need to be part of a, of a movement style trend so I'll kind of explain this better so sometimes artists have the need to be part of a movement a community a trend and somehow artists refuse to be part of this and you still have this back then because for example roberto mata like they, well we now you know if you google him or whatever you will see he's a surrealist abstract expressionist artist mm -hmm. but mata didn't want to be categorized he mm -hmm. didn't want to be classified you mm -hmm. see so it's interesting that you know you still have this in contemporary art now, that and Keith Tyson is a good example. He doesn't he doesn't like the notion of a fixed style or a fixed movement. You know, he wants to. I mean, this is a role of an artist, really, really to be experimental, right? Huh? To mm -hmm. to open new horizon, to open new ideas, to open our eyes. Huh? So that's what I think was kind of interesting here. That yeah. you know, you find 124 years after, and you still find common themes. Huh? Uh, of course, with a different sensibility, with different color palette, uh, with a different uh, you know the, the way they address it is different i mean digital art didn't happen back then but you see these common themes huh? yeah right. i was i was i'm doing an elective on them um, which includes the market for western antiquities and most students have never don't know what classic the history of greek and roman art and i was saying to them actually you know if you i can find an i can find an example from two and a half thousand years ago of anything that's happening in contemporary art so I and I get them to sort of art say, oh, well, can you think of the abstract art? And see, I've got a story about abstract art and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, what goes around comes around. What, what I was going to ask you, if you like, from a more art business level is, um, did you borrow, how did you get hold of the older art? Did you borrow it from private collections for this exhibition? Yeah, so I worked with Alan Zakheim, like Alan Zakheim Fine Arts Gallery that specialise in modern and impressionist. Yes. So that was, uh, you know, oh, I, I see it's the two galleries coming together. Yeah. The two galleries coming together. Yeah, that's yeah. what you said. I mean, I curated the show and, you know, uh, with him, we worked together on this, but I curated oh, I see. it. That's no, I get it now. That's fantastic. So I, I, I use his gallery and... Um, and uh, some of his artists too, some of uh, that, that he had. And there's exactly two galleries coming together. That's yeah. a very good example here. But, yeah. you know, when you said, you know, things coming back to you, and I think I'm going to say about Robert Mata, you know, that is important, and again, classification, you know, the need of not being classified and the refusal of being classified, that he inspired and he mentored a lot of artists like Motherwell, Jackson Pollock, Rothko, and I think today, because especially we live in a city or, you know, things are moving fast, people don't have time, it's very important that, you know, artists of today have a certain sense of helping each other and coming to together, because mm -hmm. back then in Paris, where philosophers, writers came together and help each other, right? Mm -hmm. So... You know, you need this, you need this. Yeah. And it's not part of classification because sometimes we don't want, I don't want to be classified, no, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's it's important to support each other. And I'm yeah. very, and that's why my my model is really working with people yes. uh, as a team with, you know, other galleries. Other galleries are very important because if we come together and we join our forces, we can do much more than we can do ourselves. Huh? Yeah. Uh, working with other curators, uh, consultants and I think that's what is um, interesting and I was very pleased to see Michael Greg Martin coming to the opening and he was very uh, flattering about the show and he said you don't see many things like this in London and he, he reminds me of him he reminds him of New York back then so I thought that was a good um, that's quite a compliment isn't it 
And I, I was also thinking what you've just said about people coming, philosophers and lots of different people coming together. Uh, obviously, that that was what was happening in Athens in, in the 5th century BCE with philosophers and mathematicians and artists and architects all <laughs> knowing one another and sharing ideas. And, and the same, obviously, in the Renaissance to a certain extent, in the Italian Renaissance. So I think, if, I think the more we can encourage people to you know, not to be categorized and uh, yeah. and to and to have dinner parties where you invite someone who who's doing philosophy or or history or whatever with artists and curators and the, the more the greater variety of ideas you have, the better. Um, as you say, a lot of those artists are scientists as well. Yes, the, the artists. Yeah, as I said, you know, yeah. Roberto Mata is very interested in in science. Yeah. He was yeah. very, you know, his paintings were about the theory of relativity, Einstein yeah. theory. And Keith mm. Tyson, again, very interested in, you know, mathematics, engineer, mm. uh, and other kind of sectors, right? Because uh, I think yeah. in a way, again, I think I would say this 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 sentence, which is kind of we're connected to the dynamics of the world. We're all connected to the dynamics of the world, right? Huh? So I think, um, I think, I think this Keith Tyson actually said this uh, this sentence, which I thought was was great. Huh? And then Rod Bed Mata said about the force. Uh, the hidden forces that face the world. I think that's these two sentences are great. I think, and that kind of it sounds. Summarizes. Yeah, I mean, it, so this is at twenty seven Cork Street. That's at twenty seven Cork Street. Cork Street. Yeah, and it's yeah. on until the thirty first of May. We open. Yeah, we almost we had third of April. We open, and it's on for yeah until the thirty first of May. Fantastic. So anyone listening to this should go down Court Street and, and take a look at that show. And I, I think we just all have to thank you, Virginia, because if we go to that show, obviously, we'll understand a lot of the ideas, not just of the artists, but of of your role in this, of bringing these people together. As I remember in Rifle Makers, just you and Tot working together. And even there, you were you were I, I remember when Judy Chicago was doing her work. I think you were you were you were trying to get her to recreate stuff that she'd done like a few decades before the same with Yoko Ono and at mm. the same time you were showing very very contemporary artists uh like Jamie and Jamie Shovlin and so on so it's it, that Red seems Wood, to yeah. be something that's gone through your your artistic career yeah I mean if you come to the exhibition I think and it's always good I always love to to guide people and tour yeah. people so I did this I'm doing this almost every day because okay. the gallery is composed of two floors and the the you know the Downstairs is also very, very beautiful. And we have two amazing Henry Moore mm -hmm. uh, sitting with a Sam Shandy, who's an Egyptian artist, British Egyptian artist. Mm -hmm. And he's actually a mother and child. And, you know, you've got the Henry Moore, which is the mother and child. And you have a, more, a contemporary sculpture next to it, which is also the mother and child. So we have amazing pieces also downstairs uh, and not to be missed. Uh, so, But... You know, some works which are kind of related with each other are next to each other. Some you have to find is like a puzzle. You mm -hmm. have to go back to it. And so you, that's why you have to kind of sit on the ground floor, go downstairs and maybe review it afterwards to see the connections. Because it's also, I really like to have the viewer as an active participant. You mm -hmm. know, like with the Yoko an example that she wanted to have people inside and outside looking at work. Mm -hmm. For me, it's very important also to have an active participant, right? Mm -hmm. So you ask questions, say, why is this there? Why does it work mm. with that? So you're also trying to kind of, because I think if people have these questions, the show becomes interesting, right? That they're trying to solve the question. Yeah, so Please. so you would encourage not just go, being very quiet and going around the gallery, but actually starting a discourse and a conversation with the curator, uh, you know, about... about yes, or curator. if I'm not there, they can also find it themselves. Huh? You yeah, know, yeah. you can make these connections. Huh? It's fantastic. But, yeah, but I think that kind of leads us to the, the upcoming show that I'm opening, hmm. and that's at 12 Old Burlington Street, which that's is right. like five minutes. Huh? And the title of the show is called AI and Technology Influence on Contemporary Painting. Yeah. It's a long title, but I want it to be um, specific. So it's explain uh, what it is. Yeah. yeah. And um, that kind of brings back what we're saying. I, here, I'm opening a dialogue completely with people uh, because AI is a controversial, controversial uh, topic for some. For some, it's great. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm kind of raising these questions in this exhibition. We have three amazing British artists. We have uh, Von Wolf, which is Wolf Von Likovic, 
Mm. We abbreviate it so it's easy to remember. Uh, we have Jonathan Yeo, a British uh, portrait artist, and we have Henry Hudson. Mm -hmm. so we have three great uh, British artists, yes. both very established. Mm -hmm. And kind of we're looking how the three of, of them are looking at technology and AI. So if you think of Jonathan Yeo, he also used to work at Google trying to you know, when you're trying to do face recognition. Mm -hmm. So he adopted all this virtual reality. I remember back then, a long time ago, I went to his studio and I wanted to see his painting. He said, put these glasses, virtual reality. And I was like, no, no, I want to see your paintings. <laughs> like, put your glasses. I said, okay, I'm okay. And it was like, you know, a while ago, I think I'm probably say eight years ago or more, yeah. right? And he, and he was very into this. So we have these new works uh, called Paradox of Progress. I, actually, I like the title. And it's, you have in this works, um, it, it's a mixture of 3D scan, latest te technology, algorithm, virtual reality with paint and acrylic. So it's kind of an interesting alchemy of all of this. Then you have uh, Von Wolf, Wolf on Linkovich, uh, who uses kind of the latest cutting edge node, node based system i think they call node based system diffusion models even me i cannot remember but he's very <laughs> very technical you know yeah. uh, wolf is very technical so it's called diffusion uh, models but it kind of results in amazing precision in the image but also on the in the painting because the yeah, end result they're really like, remarkable actually I, I, he came and spoke to this year's students um in the first semester with top and he, he was well, an amazing person. What and but when I saw his art, as you say, it's just absolutely remarkable. Just yeah, it's the precision. Is the precision yeah. is very important. Yeah. Uh, in technology, but yeah. also in the end result, which is all on exactly. canvas. So it's kind of interesting how you bridge the digital and the tactile together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and then we have Henry Hudson, and mm. for him, AI it's a bit some kind of creates a bit of anxiety, creates a bit of you know, hysteria. I don't know if it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. Yeah. So this is the question I want to raise to the exhibition. What do you, when you see this work, what do you think AI and technology does? Is it a tool for development? Mm. Is a, can, does, does it bring question of originality, uh, authorship, authenticity? What are the questions that come out of this this exhibition. And, the, and these, okay. Virginia, these are questions that we're discussing all the time in the institute the because academics have a big problem with this because we know our students are using this. So do we ban it altogether as a lot of UK universities? We don't think we should. We're working with okay. our trying That's to get completely. our students to use it creatively. Exactly. It's a tool. If you yeah. it's it's almost like you know, you need to know how to use it. It's almost you need to train the tool. Yeah. The you tool is to not train you, you train it. So you're yeah. the master, right? Yeah. Huh? So that's the problem with sometimes people confuse that they think that whatever AI is doing, that's what it is. No, you It'll need do to it for you and it doesn't do it yeah. for you. No, you need to train it. Huh? Yeah. So I think it's you, you I think that's what I want to achieve with this show to bring these questions. And of course, you know, AI is a big topic, technology mm -hmm. is a big topic. I mean, even now BBC, you know, they have a section on AI and sometimes yeah. there's some really interesting stories actually. But I think it's you know, it, it's something intriguing and some artists uh really use it now and it's uh, a medium it has become a medium not medium it has become a tool uh and uh it it helps and some artists have questions and they, they're completely against it so you know this is kind of a discussion i'm having with with the artists and the the public coming to the to it, see the show opening it up. also but, sounds now now you've described that other um, exhibition in Burlington Street, Old Burlington Street. Um, it also sounds as though the two experiences are meant to complement one another as well. The one is the kind of history talking to the present, and the other one is actually looking the future. at the future and current anxieties yes. about AI. So, Virginia, yeah. that, that that's tremendous yeah. discussion, and um, thank you. Well, th thank you very much for letting us see in, inside your creative mind, as it were. And I, I, I I'm certainly going to organize um a visit with with some of my students and hopefully that you can you can some of, some of them came them. already uh, I, 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 i'm sure they have i'm sure they have <laughs> yeah, um, yeah and um uh, and, and and anyone listening should obviously look look those shows up i'll put the links to them obviously in the in the literature so virginia on behalf of everyone listening to this or watching it um i think it's a great post-easter you know it's a kind of resurrectional 
uh, podcast, if you like. So thank you very much for giving us your time today. Thank you, David, for uh, having me. And thank you for everyone else for uh, joining us uh, or okay. listening.